Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores our human condition through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with researchers, authors, and practitioners to unlock the mysteries of finding and keeping you in your groove. And in this episode, we're going to hear from a practitioner who loved the application of behavioral science so much, he decided to create an association to help people apply this wonderful science to their work. His name is Connor Joyce. And like all good behavioral science practitioners, he's got a day job. <laughs> but in this case, he's a, a senior user experience researcher at BetterUp. But the key reason, the key reason we wanted to speak with him is that he and his colleagues have created the ABSA, the Applied Behavioral Science Association. It's an organization that is passionate about improving the world by promoting education and collaboration across the behavioral science community. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a classic do-gooder, hyper-passionate, full-on, high-octane, entrepreneurial kind of stuff that we just love. Yeah, well, because we don't do that. We're not high-octane, <laughs> passionate do-gooders, you know. No, in seriousness, uh, Connor and his 500 associates in ABSA have created skill sets and educational pillars for both associate and professional levels for people interested in learning how to be better at applying behavioral science in their work. Yeah, but first we need to take a small commercial break here. But so, Tim, we, we don't have sponsors. How can we have a commercial? Well, this, okay, so this is a break from our regular intro in the episode to acknowledge a specific groover. Oh, like take a moment here and listen to this great <laughs> comment. All right, got it. We have to say a big thank you for yet another five-star review in Apple Podcasts. And this one is from Chicken Idle, whose post was titled, Always Great. And this is what Chicken Idle had to say. Quote, not only do you learn a lot about b but you learn so much more. I love the casual conversations with so much personal background info, too. It's a regular must listen. I can't tell you how many books I bought from their amazing guests. Okay, you said Chicken Idle. It sounds like chicken little, but it's not. You're just messing. Are you messing up the pronunciation? What, what's <laughs> no, going on? That, that's just the name of this wonderful post. Uh, who am I to try to change it? <laughs> <laughs> also, Tim, when you said chicken it'll on a podcast, it will be memorialized like that for the rest of eternity. Yeah, that's a long time, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, more than just the author of the post will be memorialized. Their words our words will live forever too. How about that? <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing uh, for our words, but for our, our listener, that's great. So good call. Thanks for pulling me out of that weird tailspin. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, pulling me out of tailspins is your is your kind of you know superpower. There you go, because you do it all the time. Uh, okay. <laughs> As we mentioned at the top, we're here to talk with Connor Joyce about ABSA. So let's get to that. So listeners, we encourage you to sit back with a very chilled glass of applied behavioral science and enjoy our conversation with Connor Joyce. Connor Joyce, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Hello, hello. Good morning. <laughs> it is so ha so great to have you here, and we have a lot to talk about today, but let's get started with a really important question. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Good, good. Pretty you're, definitive. You're, Pretty you're definitive. in my camp. Here we go. I used to be in the tea <laughs> camp, but now I'm back hey, I'm in, in the coffee. I, oh, <laughs> there, you know, there you go. All right. They've converted me. All right, Connor, are you more of a unicycle, bicycle, or a bicycle built for two type of guy? Mm, bicycle. Bicycle. All right. Straightforward. Yeah. Very good. Right, do, Very. do you bike? I mean, the, the total off the topic and have no background on this, but do you bike a lot or no? Not at all. One of my favorite hobbies in the world. All right. So is yeah, it road bike biking or is it is it uh, mountain biking? So I road bike mostly. Yeah. I do a little bit of mountain biking. Last time I flipped over the handlebars, which everybody told me is bound to happen at some point, but uh, it made me take a pause. So I'll be back. Ah, oh, man. Maybe a little, in a little while. <laughs> everybody I've talked to that mountain bikes is, at, at some point has some injury. And so it just has kept me from really getting into it. But yeah. All right. Wow. There you go. 
Okay, third speed round question. Would you prefer to have dinner with your favorite behavioral science researcher or your favorite behavioral science practitioner? You know, I would say practitioner. Oh, okay. Caught uh, me by is, surprise there. I, I yeah. would have gone the other. I would have thought you would have gone the other way. Right. Uh, uh, why is that? You know, I think that there is a lot of science that I. It was, uh, you know, the honest answer is I've been just so so in the weeds these last couple of years that I feel like if I went and had a conversation with a scientist right now that I just have not kept up enough with the science that I would show up and really be able to be there and and ask the right questions. So. I, w- I feel like I could have a better conversation. There's a couple people who today I would love to sit down with and, and especially where I'm at in my career and have just an honest conversation about, you know, how, how did they craft themselves into the, to the personas they have today? Um, just these are people that I've, I have had a chance to meet, but it would be great to sit down and actually have dinner with them and, and do that. I mean, I would love to have dinner with some of the greats in the behavioral science field too, but, um, but I feel like I'd be as much a student. And, uh, and and really just trying to listen as I would a, a dinner partner. Fantastic. All right, last speed round question. True or false? Really easy here. True or false question. Practicing behavioral science is a lot easier than researching the concepts of behavioral science. True. True. You think it's easier, <laughs> huh? Okay. All right, you've, you've surprised me a couple of times. So let's dig into that a little bit because... Um, We'll talk about APSA in, in, in a moment, but why is, is practicing behavioral science easier than the researching of it, do you think? I think at its core, it's because randomized control trials and really developing causality is extraordinarily hard. Mm. And it's something that I've only done two or three times in my career of really being able to confidently say, we have reduced as much noise as possible, we've controlled as much as possible, and we can say with pretty strong certainty that this is actually causing this. A lot of the work I do gets close to causality, but there's enough, again, noise or enough other factors at play that I want to say it's causal, <laughs> but that I, I wouldn't go and write it. I wouldn't go and try to publish it in, a, in an academic journal because I know someone who is really has a sharp eye for that is going to uh, pick it apart yeah. realistically. So I think it is a lot easier to go and start something in, a, in an applied setting, do an A-B test with behavioral techniques, go and try to switch up, you know, a classic study, take your signing and put it at the top of the page rather than the bottom. Although I, I have heard there's, there's been some... <laughs> maybe maybe not say, that there example. There you go. Let's, go with the, let's start off with some fraudulent data to begin with. There we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> we'll stick with the first one with the AB test. Okay. So, All right. So that that one, I think there's uh, there's there's a little bit more practice behind. Yeah. But but yeah, it's a lot easier to just go and start and and, and then see and learn quickly. Uh, where I believe that the the true net new academic research requires these longer cycles. Yeah. I, it, it's interesting because I would I would agree with you. I think there's a lot of this components when we're thinking about the science of it is eliminating that noise, making sure there's not confounding factors, all of that. Whereas in an application setting, usually there's an outcome that you're trying to achieve and the causality of that outcome is not as important. I mean, it's 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 there, it's important. But if I am a CEO of a company, I don't really care as much about the causality as just making sure that that outcome is, is achieved. And so there could be confounding factors that are going into this, but if we're behaviorally informed and we're we're getting the right results, then you're going to have a powerful thing there. So yeah, Kurt, totally agree. off of my soapbox, Tim, just take over for me. So I'm done for the day. <laughs> we have to spend a, a fair amount of time talking a little bit about ABSA and we're going to get there. But because ABSA is the applied behavioral science part, let's start with a description. What is How would you describe or define behavioral science in an applied fashion or in a research fashion? What actually? Let's just start with what's what is behavioral science? What is behavioral science? Yeah, what what is it? (laughs) That's the question. That's the that's the big question in life, isn't it? What's behavioral science? Let's go write a dissertation on that. (laughs) You know, to me, behavioral science is. I look at social science 
as one big circle. And I'm, I'm respecting that we're audio only, even though you and all of us are looking at each other right now. So I'm doing a big circle with my hands. And then I see, you know, a smaller circle within it that is the field of behavioral science. I think for me, the clear, the, the delineation between the big circle of social science and the smaller one of behavioral science is does it interact with human behavior, which is obviously a very ambiguous and kind of vague definition. But I do believe there's aspects of social science that are less about true human behavior. And so that would be in the bigger circle. And then the slightly smaller circle is behavioral science. And, you know, I think one of the things that really framed my thinking on this was, so I did the master's of behavioral science at University of Pennsylvania. That's the best one I can give because I'm still kind of figuring out. And there's so many tentacles of, you can say, well, this is one subsection. And then next thing you know, you're like, well, I guess that's just all of psychology that I'm talking about. (laughs) So so it's, it's, yeah, I'll pause there. Well, that's great, actually. Uh, So what about applied behavioral science? What differentiate, what, what makes applied behavioral science different from just the study of behavioral science? Yeah, and, and, I, and I generally actually talk about it in kind of four core components. So I'll touch on those in a second. But I, yeah, I really, what I see it, the difference between applied and just overall behavioral science is the application. <laughs> and and to give that a little bit more meat, what I mean is, is like, there is creation of science for the overall expansion of, we'll say, the human knowledge. There's a great meme for those of you who are, who are in like science Twitter or science Reddit. It kind of shows there's a big circle and it's like the knowledge of humanity. And then it zooms in super close to that circle. And it's like a little highlight of the circle. And it's like, this is getting a master's because you're learning a very small slice of that knowledge of humanity in deep depth. And then it gets just like a little pimple on it of a little bulge. And it says, this is getting a PhD because you slightly expand the overall knowledge of humanity all just you know it's just one subsection it's one little boop but it is that is and so that's what i see core science being is expanding the greater body of knowledge of humanity Mm -hmm. i see application of taking that net new science that net new knowledge and finding a way to ultimately make the lives of people better but the work that ideas 42 does the work that others do in this Mm -hmm. like bucera that are all about creating better outcomes for humans. Maybe that's not always with a business mindset. That's still applied behavioral science too. So, so I'd say that ultimately that difference is net new knowledge creation versus applying it to create better outcomes for people. Fantastic. So with that background, can you tell us what about APSA, about why it was formed and what its purpose is? Yeah, absolutely. And, Honestly, no, no better people to, to share the story than, than you all, because we were talking before this, and I know you all have been doing this podcast for a while. You all have been in the field for a while. So it is, it's a, um, and it's wild how long I've been doing this too. <laughs> you know, before I start out, I know, say this multiple times because it truly is, I stand, I don't even know the saying, so I'm not going to try to say it, but something along the lines of, I stand on the shoulders of, of a lot of people. And it is because there has been so many people who have touched apps up. And who have made it the the ebb and flowing organization that it is today, with a lot of interesting and valuable deliverables along the. So it, it all started when I was a master's student. So I was at Deloitte is where I started my career, and I was a, a human capital analyst there. And I did some work at Deloitte. I worked with some, some great partners who were trying to un- better understand how they could weave in behavioral science into the work that we were doing as a large human capital management consulting organization. I decided to leave that and go and pursue my master's because I was like, hey, I want to be to that diagram. I wanted to go and become very specialized in that very small slice of the the pie of knowledge, we'll say. And so I went to uh, University of Pennsylvania to their master's in behavioral science. I got there. Overall, I think it was a great program. I had I learned so much that I was able to ultimately apply. I also was there when it was early. And so I had a chance to do a lot of electives that were all throughout the university. I had a chance to, to work with some outstanding professors at University of Pennsylvania. I, I truly am very grateful for my time there. And then I was sitting there as a behavioral scientist student thinking, this is fun. 
but I have no idea what I'm going to do now. Like <laughs> I just left this very straight and narrow career path where I was, mm. you know, I left Deloitte giving, having people tell me, Hey, if you stay here, you probably could be on partner track. Like you're good at this. We like you, you found your niche. And I go from that very direct path to a prestigious future to, hmm, I like this stuff, but I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And so that was the impetus was I was sitting there thinking, what do I do? And so I started to just talk to, again, this is where there's a lot of great mentors along the way, a lot of great people who, who um, had, you know, again, similar to you, you both that just have, a, have years ahead of me and have seen this field grow into what it is. And so I just started reaching out to people and said, hey, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> how do I, how do, where do I go from here? And, and a lot of them said, there is no path. No one has really created anything like this. And so I, I shifted quickly from, well, why doesn't it exist to, can I build it? And, and most people said, there's a need, there's a desire, but no one's taken the first step. And so I started at that time, what I called Behavioral Insights Professional Society, BIPs. And that was my first attempt at trying to co-locate resources to develop two main things, career paths for people, and then just an overall greater understanding of what this field is to the point of... And how long ago was that, Connor? That would have been 2018, early 2019. Okay. Okay. Yeah, probably late 2018. But for, for some reason, BIPs doesn't work completely for you, I gather. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's this, this story, depending on how long we, we stay on it, it's, it is, it's a story of ebbs and flows because it's really difficult. You know, to that point, there was a reason why people hadn't done this in the past because it's not easy. Yeah. And there is a lot of challenges because it's new. There's a lot of challenges because there's a lot of different people with a lot of perspectives. And then it's also challenging because to build something like this, it's generally a nonprofit yep. and nonprofits are really hard to build. Because again, it's, it's, you either need to find someone who can dedicate a lot of themselves or you need to find a lot of people to dedicate a little bit of themselves. And I've always taken that latter approach and that is then just a very difficult challenge. And so with um, BIPs, actually, that's the only time that it was the opposite where I tried to dedicate a lot of myself to building it. And it worked while I was a student. I could devote a lot of my spare time into the development of it. And it meant me reaching out to companies and asking them if they'd you know, want to sign up if they were interested, if they would share their logo so I could get other companies to sign up. It meant me trying to connect with um, just anybody in the field to say, will you share resources in some way, some capacity to help spread the word, to be able to first create a definition and then begin to start to figure out the best path forward to saying, here is how you can become an applied behavioral scientist, some sort of pipeline. And it worked for a little while. But I was a, I mean, at that point, I was only 24, 25. And I had consulting experience, which was nice. And I understood how to kind of create a business, quote unquote, but I really didn't understand the strategy side of things. And so it failed ultimately, because a, I didn't do a good job clearly delineating what I needed from people, what I was asking for, what I was ultimately going to take when when they offered things, I just did not do a good job strategically managing relationships with all of the partners who I needed at that time Mm. to be able to sign off Mm. and pretty much use their credibility to give BIPs credibility. So, so yeah, so it lasted for a while, but it ultimately began to decline. Yeah. So tell us about taking that learning and then bringing it forward. So to form, you know, the Applied Behavioral Science Association. Yeah. So a couple big steps along that way was one of them was meeting behavioral science and policy association. So I had BIPs and one of the teams that I reached out to along with BIPs was BSPA and where most conversations went decently well, I felt like something was going. I was getting ready to make them make more asks, create more structure, et cetera. BSPA and I just immediately connected. And it was mm. like, how can we work together to do this? This is something that, that they also had wanted to really build. And we're really willing to where others could say, hey, I could give you this one piece of the pie. BSPA was like, we have multiple resources, multiple aspects that we can offer you. And so I ultimately decided, I really like working with them. 
And I need to have someone who has more experience in this field. I should not just the field, but overall b- developing something like this and BSPA is, is a, is a successful nonprofit in this space. Yeah. And so I partnered with them. So that was one of the big pieces. Another piece there, and I can't remember how long afterwards was, was meeting a woman named Leanna Belcor. And Leanna and I have been, we've been co-partners on this since then. That was probably about three and a half, four years ago. And so that the combination of that squad, and let me see, there are a lot of others that have Piyush from Ideas42, Rajiv from University of Minnesota. Both of them have been pivotal to this effort too, three, four years, a lot of other people along the way. I mean, truly hundreds of people, if you sum up all, all, all the years. I can't do BIPs alone. I need to pivot this. And so we came together and we started to think about what could we do to take BIPs, take BSPA, and turn it into something greater. And so we ultimately called that Project Nexus. And oh. I just get it, Nexus, because, uh, right? Yeah. I know. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a good title. And, and so we started with that. We immediately, with that launch at BSPA, went from the six, seven of us working together to 80, 90 people who were joining our, our weekly calls. I mean, this organization really grew and had a lot of excitement. And, and then we broke into subcommittees and we got the name APSA after, again, it took us about nine months, but it was because it was a very community driven effort. Was it to your guys earlier question? That applied word. That's a big word in that word in it. And it does alienate some of the more academic heavy. It did at that time alienate some of the academic individuals. Nowadays, I, I haven't heard any critique on applied recently, which is just interesting how the mm. kind of the Overton window has changed there. But, but yeah, I'll pause and then I can go into further on the subcommittees if we want to go in that direction. You know, in the vision statement of ABSA, you note to improve the world by promoting education and collaboration across the expert and novice behavioral science community. This, of course, vision statements pack a lot. But the part that really mm-hmm. struck Kurt and I was this calling out expert and novice. Tell us about, first of all, why did you actually specifically identify expert and novice behavioral science community members? I'll preface the question by just saying, you know, I believe I played a big role in setting some of the direction of APSA. More recently, I have really seen that there is two types of applied behavioral scientists, probably more, but two very strong categories. Okay. And so that is, for an applied behavioral scientist, I think a large chunk of people use behavioral science as a minor. Select amount of people use it as a major. And what I mean by that is that I know designers, user researchers, marketers, product developers, you name it. Especially in tech, that's the field I'm mostly in. But I know it in finance too. I know it in... Um, consumer packaged goods. I've seen it in a lot of different fields. People are applying behavioral science now. It, it, the, a lot of the principles, if you look at everything from habit cycles or habit loops, tiny habits, Cialdini's principles, some of the things from thinking fast and slow, and then obviously nudge, a lot of people are beginning to weave that into their work, but they're not behavioral scientists as a, they don't have the formal education they, they may not have taken right. any courses. Right. It's truly they've read a couple books. They've maybe attended one or two online seminars or something like that. In my mind, those are behave, applied behavioral science users because they are doing their core job and then they have a specialization of behavioral science. Okay. So for a product developer, that might be learning how to implement nudges in the best ways. That might be trying to really understand habit loops and how to use habits as a re-engagement tool. A marketer might learn how to use different behavioral techniques like loss aversion or social norms to encourage new behavior. So to me, that's what the bulk of behavioral science actually is, is it's people who are using behavioral science as a minor. And so on, on our website, we might call it a novice. We call it an associate. There's, there's a couple different words. Like I said, I like to call it a user, but that's one section. And then the other section is what I, in my mind, consider the professional or just the applied behavioral scientist. And that is the individual who actually is dedicated to all of the knowledge required to be a full role behavioral scientist. So their entire role or their entire job 
is the application of behavioral science. And, and, and realistically, they're just, they're, it is still growing, but there are so many fewer applied behavioral scientists than there are people in roles who are using behavioral science as part of their toolkit. So you mentioned that behavioral science in your core job, that, that people are using behavioral science in your core job. Are you implying then that behavioral science informs part of the job, not the job itself? Is that what I'm hearing you say? I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah. And and it's interesting because, and, and well, Tim will talk to you about this, or we can talk to Tim about this, because his job inside of Truist as a behavioral scientist, but he he is that in the nomenclature that you're talking about. And Tim, forgive me if i embarrassing you or screwing you up or messing this up in, at all, but he is that expert, right? So he is the expert inside of the organization and he's working with a number of people in, from a variety of different functions to that are more of the users, as you put it, and in bringing in some of that expert knowledge into those. Tim, did I mess that up or is that, would you categorize your position in that way? You haven't messed that up, Kurt. I think, I think you're right that, and this, this really dovetails nicely into what Connor is saying, that my role within the organization is to sort of be the expert so that a lot of other people can be novices, so that other people can find a little bit of their job informed by behavioral science. And maybe behavioral science can actually help them do one portion of their job, but maybe not their whole job. And understanding, too, the other part of this is is novices understanding enough that there might be a useful component of bringing in an expert at this point, where if they didn't have that novice piece, they wouldn't even understand that, hey, this is an area where where we could bring in some deeper insights that we might enhance how we are performing or what the organization is doing. So I, I love that. I love that way of, of kind of separating it out, Connor. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. And I also think it's the way that, that we're moving. If you had to think about, so what does ABSA do for the for those people? Does, so is it, it, it's obviously bringing in both of those, but what does ABSA facilitate for those people? I said ABSA is a group of ebbs and flows, ups and downs. And, and you know, right now, I would say that we had the goal of creating those standards, of really setting up a strong definition for what is a user or an associate and what is a professional or just an applied behavioral scientist. Mm. And so you ask, what, what do we do now? And I'll be honest, not really anything. <laughs> and, and I'm at peace with, I'm at peace with that right now because that was our goal at this point was to get those standards out and see how people use it. And, and we are, we have a way. So hopefully one of the reasons along with just having a great conversation with you guys that I was looking forward to on this podcast is I'm hoping we'll get another wave of people that will hear this and say, Oh, I would love to check these standards out. And so we have a mechanism for going through and getting people's information and then sending them the framework. And I've heard so many different use cases. We can dive into some others that of, of how people are using these standards. And so it's creating ideas for us on how we could either create templates that are helpful. You know, a lot of them are job descriptions that people are, are creating. So I need to create a job description for a behavioral scientist. Well, having a stand, set of standards is a great place to start. Yeah. Another one is for students trying to do professional development, creating that career path for themselves. Or I shouldn't say career path, but um, skill, skill path or knowledge path for them. Tim, sorry, I'll, I'll let you go. That's great. I love the way that you're approaching that. And these kinds of resources are incredibly valuable, especially if we think of us in light of what you were just saying, as there's a lot of people who will be doing some kind of behavioral science, applying some kind of behavioral science to a portion of their job, but maybe not their whole job with the number of people who aren't going to be focused on, I've got a behavioral science application today that having some resources that they can go to is, I think it's a terrific idea. I think what you guys are doing is is really great stuff. Connor, you wrote a really interesting paper that kind of talked about the similarities, but differences between behavioral science, user design, UX, and data science. So this is taking us away from the APSA kind of com component, but let's talk a little bit about that. Because I think 
that's also an interesting piece. And it's one of those aspects where I think many people who aren't really the experts in this can get confused. And so just help us understand what's similar, but what's different between those. And as someone who was a behavioral researcher at Microsoft, a behavioral scientist at Tonal, a user researcher at Twilio, and now a user researcher at BetterUp, I have seen the differing sides of behavioral science, user research, and then I've always worked with data science in all four of those roles. And so trying to constantly determine the difference between that. I would even say to a degree to marketing insights is another group that I would add into that mix now. If you would have asked me when I was in my master's, I would have told you behavioral scientists own the science, whereas user research owns the user's input. Data science owns the behavioral data. And then marketing is pre-product development. That's how I would define it. Mm. So again, marketing before you build something. Data science is all of the actual raw data, especially things that are collected within the product, behavioral data, things like that. User research is getting the input of the user. So it's attitudinal data. It's a lot more qual data. And then behavioral science would be bringing in the theoretical underpinnings of whatever is being developed while also measuring outcomes of whether or not something worked. That has since changed (laughs) because I realized there is not as clear lines in most organizations as that. I'd even argue in human life, in in life, (laughs) we don't have those kinds of clear definitions. Excuse me, but but, but go ahead. Yeah, no, fair enough. And, And so I, looking just at the field of user research, I am beginning to question how much that has that difference from what we might call like applied research or what, again, I may have called just what the behavioral science role was. Again, that more science because in my user research roles, I'm still creating theoretical underpinnings. I'm still thinking about how to, I'm doing literature reviews and work like that yeah. to inform product development. And when I was a behavioral scientist, I still did user interviews (laughs) and I still did, I did diary studies. So I used traditionally user interview or I should say user research techniques. And so the, to again, circling back to your initial question, what is the difference? Every day I feel like there's fewer and fewer differences between the fields and that all of them are. And again, I'm, I am focused mostly in tech. So I just, I like to preface it because that's where I come from. But in the tech environment, I more and more am becoming part of the camp that believes really all those groups that we just referenced are doing research. And that research is is for the point of trying to develop evidence to answer questions, to build better products and solutions. And each of those subfields that we just talked about are just a collection of different tools, techniques, and a way to analyze the data. Yeah. Beautifully said. And this is a great opportunity for us to segue into how all those things could be applied in deciding what two musical artists you would take with you if you had to be on a desert island for a year. (laughs) How was that? Your your transitions are getting so much... (laughs) I want to say better, but I can't. (laughs) Are you hanging with us, Connor? We'll we'll go with that, but... I think you need to make clarify though too, just as most of our you know listeners know that it's not the actual artist, it's their catalog of music. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you don't have to sit there last night. with a, you know with Bach. Uh, yeah, with Bach or with uh you know, I don't know, George Thorogood or whoever it is that you decide <laughs> to bring on. I wish I was had such sophisticated uh choices <laughs> as Talked to my wife about this last night. I was oh. like, they're going to ask me a question about music. Oh. And I'm not going to lie. I am not a big music person. I'm a podcast guy. Great. I am the, I look at music as a means to an end when I'm working, when I'm looking for energy, oh. etc. And so I wish I could give you a solid answer. This said, the mo- most music that I listen to is EDM music, okay. electric dance music. That is overall, that is like, 
I truly, I like barely know any artists outside of just EDM artists. Okay. I have two favorite EDM artists, Alinium and Tiesto. Two, one is more house, fast beats. That's Tiesto. Alinium is a little bit more, I, I would call it musical as maybe one way to put it. It's like a, there's instrumental. And I actually had a chance to see both of them this past summer. Oh. And uh, there's a beautiful venue here in Washington called The Gorge. Uh-huh. And I saw both of them. They truly two favorite artists decided to go on tour together and do this. And and so um, I guess you asked me for both. So so I would I would bring their both their their music. If you want to ask me for my favorite, I might tell you. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I well, was, <laughs> you know that's like you know I don't know for some people that's like choosing your favorite kid. It just you you don't want to ever say it out loud. You have it in the back of your head, but you don't ever want to say it out loud. Um, but but Connor, you talked about you use it for work and for energy. So do you listen to music when you work? I do. Yeah, yeah, mostly non vocal. And so there's a, a, a label called Anjuna Beats. And it is, um, it's a, the main artist they have it on is called Above and Beyond. That's who I believe started the label. Uh, and, but they're more like trance, a little bit of house, like progressive house might be, uh, some of the subcategories. And a lot of their music, they have just non vocal beats that, again, that's kind of what trance is. It, it is, it puts you in a trance, quote unquote. Right. So I like that type of music for work. Uh, it just gives gives me a beat, gives me something to. I also use a, a treadmill desk, so I'm 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 a pretty fidgety person. Again, you all can see me on video, but <laughs> I'm standing on a little plank board, yep. so I can I can go left and right too. I'm just I'm overall a pretty fidgety person, and so between you know adding some movement and then adding some music, that really actually helps my body wow. get distracted. And my mind to just focus purely on my work. Oh, I love it. It's interesting. So I recently just had an MRI and they put on this really crappy headset for you. Oh. And you get to pick your <laughs> pick your music that you want. And of course, you know, Tim will know this. I picked 80s alternative. Um, but then the MRI is really loud. And it and I was expecting it to be just this were different things, but it's not. It's it's it reminded me of like house music. House. It was yeah. like pump, 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 and it had all these different beats. And I'm like sitting there going, "Oh, I sh- I picked the wrong music. If I would have picked like a, <laughs> a, a house or trance, it would have like gone along with it." And it was like, but it was like distracting because the beats were not on with the music that I was listening to. So anyway, that was, that was an interesting piece that I found. Like, I'm like going, oh, you can take a whole, maybe I could just record this and we can make this a whole, you know, the MRI, you could have a whole, you know, band on, on MRI, you know, the DJ. Anyway, sorry, I was a whole aside, but it reminded me, you, once you started saying that, I'm like going, I was thinking about this just the other day. <laughs> I doubt I would have ever remembered it. But I actually had a very similar experience. I got an MRI, yeah. was listening to EDM music, and was like, "Oh, I get a double beat because <laughs> I've got that." Is that's it? That dun, 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 dun. And, yeah, it's got the clicks in there. I was like, "Oh, like all right, I guess just throw in some extra beats here." So, oh wow, yeah. Oh, Connor, it's uh, really a, a pleasure to have you as a guest today. Thanks, thanks for joining us, and and thanks for telling us about um, Absa. Yeah, Tim, Kurt, it was, it was a pleasure too. I, I really appreciate it. I, I'll leave you with this. And I, I, um, so I, in between starting this two job and la- leaving my last one, I tried to start a company that was utilizing generative AI to help develop rapid user research. And the way that I pitched it was that I was like, I don't believe generative AI will replace user researchers. What I do believe is that generative AI will eventually make it so that any product person can be a junior user researcher, just as they can be a junior data scientist or a junior market insights individual. And so what I mean by that is that I believe that the democratization of research is inevitable because we need more research. We know that there's always a deficit of the time and resources to do research. And I believe that generative AI is going to be one of the ways to accelerate how fast people can do research. And so to the point that we're talking about here, I think that is the future is that you're going to have guiding people who are helping lay out the vision for where things go. And then 
along the way, there's going to be a lot of different individuals who can go and actually do some of the work with tools that help them do it in an effective manner. Yeah, I've listened to podcasts for a long time. Really respect the work that you you both do. And so uh, uh, I said it, I think, before the recording, but honored to be here and uh, really appreciate you all having me on. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Connor, have a free flowing conversation, and groove on whatever else comes into our ABSA brains. The ABSA brain. The, of course. The ABSA brain. You have an ABSA brain, don't you? Everybody's everybody's got an ABSA brain, don't they? Yeah, I mean, because in reality, we're all behavioral scientists, all applied behavioral scientists. Because oh, we use I, behavioral science in every day, every single I would, day. I was thinking that if you're not present, you're ABSA. <laughs> <laughs> but that maybe caught me I so was, by surprise. That was good. Maybe, maybe that was. Maybe that's the wrong. That's the wrong <laughs> approach here. I don't think. I don't think that's what Connor Joyce had in mind. I don't think that's what Connor <laughs> had in mind. But I do think that there is this aspect of applying behavioral science, that we do it all the time. We've talked about this before. We've talked about this aspect where behavioral science is really just understanding the behavior and why we do that behavior. And oftentimes, like we've interviewed, as we talked about early on in the show, accidental behavioral scientists who are doing great work, but they don't have the behavioral science background, but they're applying these principles because they work, because they are things that they've either learned through trial and error or have some intuition on, but they're behavioral science principles. It's the restaurateur who puts people, you know, the first people to come to the restaurant in the evening in the window seats to make it seem like the the restaurant is busy. Well, they don't understand social proof. They just know that by putting people in the windows, they get more people into the restaurant overall. That's a great call, uh, Kurt. It, re- it reminds me of our our first conversation with, I think it was our first conversation with someone that we considered an accidental behavioral scientist, David Hussman. He's an agile developer. Yeah. He's a coder. And yet he absolutely saw the world through a behavioral science lens and brought that to his work. And I think that there's other there's other jobs where you can bring behavioral science into your work. Which is one of the key things that I think I took out of this conversation is that applying behavioral science in your job doesn't mean you have to be a behavioral scientist. (laughs) Bing. (laughs) Right. Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) Right. I mean, that is. Exactly. And I I think most practitioners of behavioral science understand that. I think the people that often don't think that are the ones who have not been practicing this and they're. It's like, oh my gosh, it's too overwhelming. I have to go back to school Mm -hmm. or I have to get this degree or I have to really study. And yeah, you have to learn things. You have to be cognizant of the behavioral science principles, but you don't need a PhD as is very well proven by you um, and others. (laughs) I I didn't mean that. That that, that sounded negative. No, point point taken. No, I didn't mean that because you're doing fantastic things. And yet you don't have formal training in this. You have, you have, you know, lived learning through this. So, yeah. And intentionally, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I had nothing else to do. So I think I'll read that book on, you know, thinking fast and slow. <laughs> you know? And the other thing on this is I think it goes beyond somebody reading thinking fast and slow or nudge or, you yeah. know, any of the other countless, you know, books out there and going, Oh, I've read this book. I know everything. That's not it either. Right. Now right. that can help. It can inform, but if you want to apply behavioral science it's a little more than that. It is a little more than just reading a book and going, I am now a behavioral scientist and I can apply this in my work. Well, getting back to this this idea of our thinking about David Hussman as a, uh, the, the late David Hussman as a coder, as an agile developer, what are some of the other jobs that you could be doing and actually apply some behavioral science to it? We've had a lot of interest in the show and in the meetups that we did from the UX community, user Mm -hmm. design community. I think 
those are significantly or significant opportunities to apply behavioral science into that. I think advertising is ripe for this. Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, you think of Ogilvy. I mean, you think Rory Sutherland, again, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. brilliant in this, but doesn't have formal training in this. Copywriters. Yeah. So all the jobs associated with advertising, brand development, brand management, all of the, the, the kind of the classic ad firm things that go into it would yeah. certainly be included. Yeah. Graphic artists, even. I mean, thinking yeah. about applying some of the principles into the graphical design of elements. What else, Tim? What What do you think? What are some of the maybe non-advertising marketing type things that come really easy to mind? What about data analysts? You know, what about people who are actually getting their fingers dirty in the databases, you know, that are sort of data scientists or data analysts? I, I could, you know, I mean, we, one of our good friends, Christian Hunt yeah. is, is, is in compliance. Yeah. And what a great place to apply, to be thinking about the application of behavioral science from a compliance perspective. What about attorneys? Thinking about attorneys <laughs> yes, that can yes. bring behavioral science into not just the courtroom, but into the boardroom and other areas where they're working. Leadership, any type of leadership within an organization, if you have people reporting up to you, you can be a applied behavioral scientist. You should be an applied behavioral scientist because you're dealing with humans and trying to understand what is motivating and engaging them. Well said. And that that bridges me into all of the HR rules because there you go. Human, human resources is all about people. So uh, just about any role that you could imagine in, in an HR environment could be uh, informed by behavioral science. And that's, that's just to get our list started. Yeah. What, what about an ant farmer? (laughs) Assuming that the ant farmer has to market their ants that they're, they're growing, you know, then I'd say that there's an application of behavioral (laughs) science. (laughs) All right. Sorry about that. That was just, uh, okay. Yes. So I think the long and short of this is that, All of many, many jobs can benefit from having a behavioral science perspective placed Mm -hmm. on them. And that doesn't mean that you have to be 100% behavioral scientist or have the educational background. What it means is that you need to be a student of this and then start applying, figuring out how to apply those principles in your area of expertise, which is, I think, the wonderful aspect of this. So if if our listeners have that curiosity, let's say that they're interested in finding their groove with a little bit more behavioral science in it, ABSA is a great place to start. Yeah, which right? Connor has talked about, right? ABSA, yeah. they have the different ways and, and really they do a nice job of kind of differentiating between that associate and that upper level and kind of the different pieces that you need there. However, mm-hmm. I think there's more, right? Absolutely. I think that there's a whole variety of, of associations. Let, actually, let's just start with some, some other associations that, that you might be interested in, like GABS, which is the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists, uh, founded by Steve Martin and Nula Walsh. Great. Um, yeah, we both on this, this podcast before. So Terrific organization. Uh, if, again, that's kind of a join up kind of an organization and just and you do have to apply. But there's there's others that you can go. You could go to Action Design Network yep. or just sort of signing up and being a part of conversations with people who are in both the academic and the applied uh, reign. They have and a lot of meetups. resources that they have um, as part of that, yeah. that network. And Zarak, good friend of ours, is one of the the leaders in that, as well as yeah, Steve uh, Wendell founded, and founded by Steve. Yeah, yeah Steve Wendell did a who fantastic is also thing on there. this. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of online. Um, Things Irrational Labs with Kristen Berman and her colleagues have great online programs in behavioral design, right? Various different pieces. So again, we didn't even talk about design, which is huge, right? Any kind of design job definitely should be thinking about how to apply behavioral science to it. 
our buddies, Christina Gravert and uh, Nurit Nobel formed a, a business called Impactually in Stockholm, and they've created some great online courses to introduce sort of the more academic side of behavioral economics and how the fundamentals of biases and heuristics work. Yeah. It's a, it's a terrific, uh, terrific course yeah. uh, that, that we've been through. But but let's say that they somebody wants to amp it up a bit more. Amp it up Where a they, bit more? I, well, yeah. I mean, so even let's, let's before we amp it up, let's just go back. I mean, there's there's Habit Weekly out there. There's yeah. Behavioral Scientists. Great websites for both of those. Again, uh, great insights, great comments that people are bringing in. And then I think, you know, there's all sorts of wonderful podcasts, not just Behavior Grooves, which we think probably is one of the best, if not the best. But, you know, we'll be humble and we'll say there's lots of others out there. There are. Um, there again, are. just Hidden Brain is a fantastic one. You have... I'm drawing a blank, Tim. Melina about, Palmer about, and uh, uh, the the brainy business, brainy business, or, Christian which is Hunt very good. Has it, his own, you know. So yeah, human risk. Yeah, that's a fantastic one. Yeah, and Melina Palmer's is great, especially if you're into sales specifically, marketing and sales. You, yeah, marketing and sales. Uh, with the brainy business is, is great. Of course, uh, Andy Latrell's oh, opinion my God. science. Yeah is just outstanding. The, uh, is a great science ed- communicator. Yeah, and and um a guest that will be on uh that we've already recorded, but think fast, talk smart is another one, the Stanford uh uh science podcast. I, th- I think I just messed up that name. No, I think I think think I think it's uh think it's um yeah. And then there's big thing Abraham and then yeah. So lots and lots, and we we are not even. I'm sure we've missed a ton. I mean, actually, uh, choiceology and uh, yeah, Katie Milkman's choiceology and the Happiness Lab. The happiness from Lab, Hansen. you know, all yeah. of those are great. Um, as we're going, and and we we'll forgive anybody else that we have left out on this. Oh man, I'm, there's a ton, and I, I know I know that we're missing, but this is just. To point somebody in the direction, these are some ideas to consider. Yeah, and I will uh, will put out some social media on this and kind of list these out, and then whatever we've missed, let's hopefully let's get people to start you know tagging on and and commenting to add yeah. to that list that we have. All right, Tim. So now let's dive deeper. How do we get in deeper beyond <laughs> beyond that? Well, you know, and Connor mentioned this. Connor mentioned that he went through the Masters of Behavioral Science program at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, which uh, you know our our buddies Christina Gravert and Chris Nave uh, founded and got started, and we love the program. You mentioned Zarak Khan. You know, he is at uh, ADN, uh, but he's also you know um, a, he does an adjunct professorship at um, at the uh, Penn program. And it's a great program. It's a really great way of getting deep into all of the ins and outs of what makes applied behavioral science work in the, in the real world. So I just, I just want to call that one out. And of course uh, the, the London school of economics, the LSE has a terrific master's program as well. I um, just want to call uh, attention to that. Liam Delaney, uh, I, I think under his tutelage and Paul Dolan and and uh, Rob Metcalf have created something that's just fantastic uh, at the LSE. And Warwick over there has a, a behavioral science program, oh, too. Yeah. I think a summer school. Cowry, our friend Jez Groom, who uh, also Diversify, which is the largest uh, network of behavioral uh, science consultancies in the world, which Cowry, along with uh, my company, Lantern Group, and 18 others, Founded, and I think we're up to twenty some companies now, and and we're doing that. But Cowrie has their summer school, which is a intense two week kind of uh, crash course for people who yeah. are interested in taking this, which is fantastic. They get forty, I think it's forty people every year. Uh, they're yeah. now doing it worldwide. It's it's a fantastic way if you're really interested in this and want to get it to the next level. Those are some great opportunities to do that. So. I would also like to just add to this list, if you just want to have a little bit of behavioral science impact in your life, just a tiny little bit in your daily life where you just go, oh, I'm aware that behavioral science is having a playing a part. I would want to recommend the Brain Shift Journal from the Lantern Group. <laughs> right. Well, yep. that, 
Thank you for that nice plug, Mister <laughs> Houlihan. I, yeah. I'm going to have to buy you a beer now for for I that. Think I think there, but no. I, all right, I, to to take my humble hat off, I I agree. I mean, it's one of those nice things, and we're coming out with volume two of the Brain Shift Journal. Awesome. And then yeah. we also have uh, the different guides. So we have Goal Shift to help you better align around your goals, which are PDF downloads that are uh, cheaper, and then Decision Shift to help you with your decisions. And they're all based on yeah. behavioral science and they're really practical. So if you are in a business and you are saying, how can I improve, you know, my goals or setting my own goals or making my own decisions with a behavioral science bend, uh, then you can download those. Those are great. So I love it. I love it. Okay. So I think that about wraps up the key discussion points. With kind of, yeah. And, about. and again, the, we've listed out a whole bunch of things and I'm sure we've missed hundreds of times more than what we've listed out. So I hope people go out and just search, just go do quick Google search and start looking and dig and kind of take that rabbit hole and go down this if you're interested in this. There's lots of really great content out there. And we hope that this week you can take these ideas and that they help you go out and find your groove. <laughs>